So welcome everyone to our symposium, Active Learning Through Virtual Realities and 3D Avatars, a sneak peek behind the scenes of the process of conception, development, and implementation. Um, my name is Nadia Nafi. I'm an assistant professor of education technology at Université Laval, and I also hold the chair in uh, Innovative Pedagogical Practices in Digital Context National Bank, and also I co-lead uh, the Access Education and Capacitation uh, or Empowerment uh, of OVIA. I will be uh, facilitating this uh, symposium today with my dear colleague, Anne-Louise Davidson. So Anne-Louise, maybe you can present, uh, introduce yourself very quickly. <laughs> go ahead. Certainly. So I'm Anne-Louise Davidson. Um professor in education uh, at Concordia University, actually full professor since June 1st. So I'm celebrating that. Uh, I hold a research chair in maker culture and uh, I uh, direct uh, the innovation lab at Concordia. I'm also the associate director of the Milieu Institute for Arts, Culture and Technology. And I wear several hats in the university. So I'll hand it over to our panelists and um, focus on the important VR aspect of this. Thank you, Eloise. So today we have uh, six innovative panelists from Laval University, Concordia University, and Stanford University to share a critical, as I said, sneak peek behind the scenes um, of all the conception of uh, virtual reality experiences, learning experiences, and using also avatars. Uh, so I'm going to start with our first panelists. So Professor Julie uh, Lessard and Maud Picard, education technologist from Université Laval, who will address the conception and the development of a VR project for undergraduate students in an introductory family intervention course in, in psychoeducation, its objectives, and the literature supporting the use of VR to meet these objectives. The floor is yours. Thank you, Nadia. Let me share my screen quickly here. That's good. Okay, so um, thank you. Uh, I'm Julie Lessard. I will be presenting with Maud Picard today, and we will just uh, first give you some context about um, this project, so the course for which it was developed, and um, why we chose virtual reality in this. Uh, for this project. We will address the initial plans for the conception phase that we had and uh, the challenges that we overcame through this uh, conception phase, uh, and then address the challenges and, and obstacles that we have in the development phase uh, that led us to explore new options and where we are now. So this will be the plan. So. Like Nadia said, this is for a family intervention course. It's for undergraduate, they're in second year of uh, their curriculum. And so at this point, they have no stage or internship uh, and no experience. It's an online course. And because it was developed before COVID, it was when you developed an online course, it was fully online and no Zoom meetings. Or if you did, like when, when I did that, I had to give in advance the dates and the time and they were put on a schedule months ahead of time. So uh, they really wanted it to be fully online, autonomous for students to do the work. Um, and because I knew that the success rate for online courses were uh, not as good as traditional courses. I wanted to make sure there were some significant activities for the students uh, to stay engaged and go through this course. It's a mandatory course, so it's important for students to go through this and, and uh, have a, a good experience. So the objectives of the course, because it's a family intervention, it's it has to go, for me, it has to go beyond just the knowledge uh, and doing exams. It has to go also into practice and intervention. And so the objectives are to use some of the tools, the assessment tools that we have to understand the family and then be able to use all the knowledge that you have to develop intervention objectives and plan your intervention with the family. So I want them to use the knowledge and be able to apply it so that when they go into their stage or internship next, the year after, they have some idea of how to do this. So there are multiple reasons for using virtual reality for this project. Uh, experiential learning 
is a big one. It's something that's uh, important to me because it allows to use the knowledge and apply it. So I wanted to uh, to do that and virtual reality allows that. The immersive virtual reality, so when you use the head mounted gear, for example, uh, allows us to have something that's really close to reality. So you're able to have to, to feel the emotions and the feel and have real feelings. Uh, and because you're using it, stimulating all your senses, you actually feel like you're uh, in the room or in the environment that you're supposed to be. And so you can get really close to that real environment. It helps with student engagement, which was important since it was an online course. And the last one, which was also very important to me, was it was it provides a safe environment uh, to experiment. And because they don't have experience, I can't send them into a home and say, oh, go meet with the family and ask them what their difficulties are and have them experience a family who has a crisis or uh, gets starts crying and they don't know what to do with this. So as for the family as well as for the students, it had to be a safe environment. So uh, that's part of the reasons why we chose this option to go with the virtual reality. So the initial plan was to have uh, two meetings at home. So the students would go through a first meeting with the family. So it would be a, a small family of four with two parents, two kids, and they would meet the family. They would ask about their needs, their expectations. They would do what a psycho educator does when it goes into a home and explain their roles, their mandates, the services they, they can provide and how they're gonna work with the family. And then they can explore the situation, the, the current situation, the problem, and the history of the family, see if there's anything else or how they solved other problems in the past uh, and start collecting data for a genogram and observe the family environment. So it was a uh, just like a real, a real meeting in a family. And then there would be a second one where they could continue to get data, uh, explore the family uh, situation to get to a point where they have enough information to, to build a plan, an intervention plan uh, with objectives. And some of the choices we made were that would be the student would have no wrong choices. Like they, they couldn't make a wrong choice. They, they would have tons of choices. Uh, do you want to talk about the routine, the kids routine? Do you want to talk about uh, the family's uh, new employment for the father and, and the changes in the family? But none of those were wrong or would create a conflict. Or It was just the idea to show that you can ask different questions and you will get different information. But all of this is is still a good um, a good choice to make. So that's the choice we made. And then uh, the plan was also to have a virtual meeting in between the first meeting to discuss in between the first two meetings with the family to discuss with the students what information they got, what choices they made. So not just to to really try to help them under like be aware of what choices they made and why they made those choices so that when they go and meet a real family, they, they're conscious of those decisions uh, that they make. And Maud, I will pass on pass to you. So Julie tested many times our word version scenario in class before we got into uh, the project that we're going to describe. And from that point to achieve the final goal, which was a VR experience, the decision was made to first work on a non-immersive uh, scenario version, similar to a video game. So we could work at the environment and then create a second version of that scenario, but including uh, immersive, uh, a more ex immersive experience. Uh, it also seemed a good way to proceed because some people experience motion sickness when they use VR. So having a non-VR version uh, could be very useful for those people. They need to go through the production to achieve the course objectives. So we had to have another option. So as the first meeting with the family was, as in real life, quite a long interview, our strategy was to uh, create what we called a demo version that was way shorter than the whole hour interview to test some parts of the scenario and uh, the different concepts that we identified 
as uh, necessary for the student's experience, both, both for the pedagogical and technical aspects of the, the project. So uh, making that demo, many uh, technical challenges were overcome. Uh, just to give a few examples that we've uh, been through, uh, blocking the player from going through the walls, uh, optimizing objects so they, they are uh, way lighter and we could play the game, um, managing the lighting calculations that would make the production very slow otherwise, setting up the environment so the psycho educator would not uh, stand up on objects, like stand up on the kid's bed, for example, which would have been really weird in the game, uh, using a dialogue management system, adding subtitles if the player wants them or needs them, uh, programming some of the player moves in the apartment, allowing the player to go around the apartment uh, freely and interact with objects, etc. So that was a very, very uh, important step. Uh, so what you will see in a few seconds are small parts of that demo version. Uh, you will also see some of the decisions that were made during the conception phase of the project. So the student that experiment the scenario we're going to show you uses the psycho educator's view. So the student sees the family and the environment as a real person would see it. Um, the student has choices to make. You will see them at the bottom of the screen in gray rectangles, so you can pay attention to that. Um, we added way more choices that we initially planned uh, to keep the player active during the experience. Uh, we used a temporary narration also, thanks to my son that played the little girl, and uh, before recording the professional voices. And going through that temporary narration process made us realize that the scenario would have to be revised to make it more fluid and more natural because we started from a written scenario. Um, we also quickly realized that we would have to design a sound environment, uh, which is a project by itself. Because seeing, for example, a person walking in an absolute silence was really, really weird. So only a few sounds were included in the demo version, but a final version would need a very more uh, rich, richer environment. Um, before uh, Julie plays on the pushes on play. Uh, let me draw your attention also to uh, in the second part of the video, you will see how the player can navigate into the environment freely, uh, click on some objects, read their description, load them in an observation journal, because students have to complete an observational, that's a really difficult word, observational measure of the family environment, but also it was planned that the player would, at the end, wear a VR headset, so could not take notes, so we had to free the, the ends of the, the player. Uh, and the video will also illustrate another challenge that we faced. Many objects in the same style were required to fill the apartment and make it alive. Um, so we needed a we needed a disorganized apartment to reflect the family situation. So bundles were bought from the web to have ready-made objects that could uh, and characters because making custom objects is really really time-consuming. And we also found free objects objects on the web, and it was also very time-consuming to find them and making sure they would be uh, compatible with the production that we uh, we made. So. Let's look at the video. Choices. Oh, we don't have the sound. That's fine. So usually when you click, you have the sound of the narrator that, that goes with it. And then uh, the narrator says, oh, uh, Amelie, can you walk me through the apartment? And then she says, yes. So now what you can see is the player going around the apartment, looking at the objects on the floor, um, 
the next thing you'll see is an observational observable object. So the door, so you can click on it. You have a description related to the scenario. It goes in the observation journal and you can go back to it as much uh, as many times as you need it. And then we will walk you through the apartment that we've created. So the kitchen you already saw, a bathroom that was a part of the scenario. And then at the end of the corridor, we have the kid's bedroom that was um, designed and other objects were observable in that uh, room also. That's it. Okay, uh, Mode, since we only have about two minutes left, I'm gonna move on <laughs> quickly. Uh, in terms of challenges um, and obstacles, uh, the human resources uh, was definitely the main one to find the right expertise to be able to hire it. It's, it's not a simple challenge. Um, and, and that one certainly, uh, was a big obstacle for us. Uh, financial was a big one. We were able to get lots of funding, but unfortunately, uh, some of the funding came with the condition that you couldn't hire outside, like you couldn't hire a company to do the work. It had to be done on, on campus. And so that, uh, became an issue as well at one point, uh, in terms of conception, uh, let me, uh, um, we, uh, it, it was just, the project was just so big and so long. And like Mo said, we made some options for students to keep them active. And it became with so much branching that uh, you would see this map, it became like a maze for uh, developers to try to work through this. Um, and so that was a, a big issue. And in terms of technical issue, well, the list is uh, quite long, but let's say uh, characters, you could buy them in bundles, but some of the ones we bought were so heavy, it was unusable. Some other ones had to be completely designed because they were not available in bundles. Um, and you can use uh, the head mounted uh, gear on iOS and other technical issues. I'll stop there because we're uh, getting over our time. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Julie and Maud. That was very, very impressive. So, uh, just a very quick, uh, quick remark. I uh, we will hold our questions and comments and or our reactions because I know I'm, I'm sure that you will be having a lot of reactions when you will be seeing all these amazing projects. So we will be holding them till the end. Uh, and I know we will. Then, be yeah, go ahead. Uh, can I just? I, I I said I just stopped there because I was passing on ah, the most. Okay, okay, go ahead. But if you if you let just um, mode, maybe I'll just continue quickly and, and just show uh, what we did. We did articulate last semester and we had a scenario like this and we had drawings. And so students could click on things and have the interactions. And um, and uh, we've actually partnered now with Knowledge One. I know I saw, I think Ping is there. I think uh, Julieta is there. So thank you, Nadia, for this. We will have next year our 3D virtual reality uh, to show you. So we're pretty excited about this. <laughs> so thank you. I'll stop here. Okay. Sorry for interrupting you before. So now, uh, thank you so much for, for your presentation. And now I'm moving to our next uh, presenters. So we have Professor uh, Isabelle Bifou and Julie Christine Gagné, who's an education technologist, both from Université Laval. And they will be discussing the steps that led to the implementation of eight clinical cases, each animated by a 3D avatar with a complex mental disorder with whom the students intervene throughout the session, first individually and then as a team. So the floor is yours. J'avais oublié d'ouvrir mon micro avant de partager. Alors, euh, <coughs> bonjour à tous et à toutes. Il nous fait grandement plaisir d'être avec vous euh, aujourd'hui. On va se tenir assez euh, étroitement à notre agenda et je démarre tout de suite mon truc. Alors, on va voir c'était quoi le contexte de développement des avatars, la co-construction pédagogique et l'appareillage, ainsi que les effets déclarés par les étudiants. Contexte de développement, d'abord débuté par une citation, « La nécessité est mère d'invention ». Alors, pourquoi débuter par ça? Parce qu'en fait, euh, le contexte dans lequel le cours s'est développé, c'est que c'est un cours d'intervention à la santé mentale 
qui est offert au baccalauréat à la deuxième année. Et ce cours-là, au départ, était optionnel. Alors, je le donnais aisément à une quarantaine d'étudiants et du jour au lendemain, il est devenu obligatoire. Alors, je passais de 40 à 90 étudiants, alors il fallait vraiment trouver une solution rapide. Et on avait toutes ces questions-là, comment faire pour guider l'apprentissage de l'intervention clinique, rendre justice à la réalité évolutive de l'intervention et gérer l'absence de bagages cliniques des apprenants versus la fragilité de la clientèle, évidemment, des personnes qui souffrent de troubles de santé mentale. Alors, bon, ben, réflexe de chercheur, qu'est-ce qu'on fait dans ce contexte-là? Je suis allée fouiller la littérature et euh, ce qu'on a vu surtout, c'est que euh, l'esprit critique des étudiants en intervention clinique, c'est vraiment quelque chose de très, très, très difficile à mobiliser et que euh, c'est vraiment quelque chose sur lequel on doit tabler parce que même à la fin de leurs études, on voit que c'est vraiment par quelques pourcentages seulement que les étudiants ont avancé, alors que cette compétence est centrale dans les professions d'aide. Donc, on s'est dit, il faut vraiment aller pousser plus loin cette compétence-là. On voyait aussi que les insuffisances des, des vignettes cliniques qui ne rendaient pas justice à la complexité des cas rencontrés dans la pratique, donc ça ne fonctionnait pas très bien. Les avatars, de leur côté, euh, selon la littérature, pouvaient augmenter l'esprit critique des étudiants, contribuaient à construire leur identité euh, professionnelle, leur apprenaient à apprendre de leurs erreurs et aussi à se familiariser avec la frustration qui est inhérente à l'intervention clinique. On pouvait évidemment augmenter la complexité des cas, mais aussi la complexité de l'analyse qu'on demandait de faire aux étudiants. Évidemment, ça permet de faire un lien entre la théorie et la pratique qui est comme obligatoire dans ce cas-ci. Euh, la littérature montrait que ça facilitait la rétention des connaissances chez les étudiants. Et évidemment, ça constitue un environnement d'apprentissage qui est sécuritaire autant pour l'apprenant que dans ce cas-ci pour les personnes qui ont des troubles de santé mentale pour lesquelles euh, on n'interviendra pas directement tout de suite. Euh, L'accessibilité est quand même une grande force, c'est-à-dire que l'étudiant peut revenir aussi souvent qu'il veut sur son avatar, peut le faire au domicile, peut le faire sur le campus, il peut le faire dans l'autobus, il peut le faire où il veut. Et euh, dans certains cas, ça montrait que ça, ça pouvait même faciliter une certaine forme d'empathie avec la vacance. Donc, on s'est dit « Yay! C'est sûr qu'on fait ça! » Mais euh, comment qu'on va faire ça? Donc, la question numéro un, comment on va évaluer ce qui constitue être une bonne intervention versus une moins bonne. Comment on va s'assurer que les enseignements théoriques s'incarnent dans l'intervention clinique de l'apprenant? Dans le contexte des interventions interdisciplinaires, comment développer aussi les compétences à communiquer sa propre analyse clinique? Et comment maintenir l'étudiant engagé envers son avatar durant toute la session? Et c'est là qu'entre en jeu tout le travail de co-construction et d'appareillage qu que nous avons fait ensemble, moi et Julie. Donc, euh, oui, je vais prendre le relais, puis je vais tenter de répondre à, à la plupart de ces questions montrant comment, euh, comment ils ont structuré, en fait, la réflexion d'Isabelle et moi autour de la manière dont on allait mettre en œuvre ces avatars-là, tant du point de vue pédagogique que du point de vue euh, technologique, finalement. Donc, la première étape avec laquelle on a travaillé, évidemment, c'est la scénarisation détaillée des cas du point de vue des contenus. Donc, Isabelle a travaillé avec ses étudiants gradués pour développer huit cas de personnes qui présentent un trouble de santé mentale complexe. Et ces, 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 ces cas-là vont s'articuler autour de cinq rencontres euh, durant lesquelles les étudiants vont, être mis, vont avoir une mise en contexte, comme on peut voir à l'écran, et ils vont euh, pouvoir lire un échange entre l'avatar et l'intervention qui se trouvent être eux-mêmes le via leur, leur petite photo de profil. Euh, et euh, durant ces mêmes rencontres, des, des décisions liées à l'intervention sont confiées aux étudiants. Donc, ils devront, euh, en fonction de l'évolution des notions théoriques présentées dans le cours, là, déterminer tour à tour l'aspect prioritaire abordé au cours des prochaines rencontres, le besoin prioritaire à prioriser pour l'intervention, des cibles d'intervention, euh, une approche prioritaire et finalement, ils vont avoir à faire un travail individuel dans lequel euh, ils vont devoir identifier des techniques d'intervention pour les cibles. Donc ça, c'était la première étape au niveau des contenus. Euh, la deuxième étape, bien sûr, le cœur du travail. Euh, Isabelle, tu peux avancer le, le diapo, merci. Euh, ça a été de développer nos fameux avantages, donc euh, d'aller... Euh, d'aller les scénariser du point de vue visuel. Donc, on a accordé beaucoup d'attention à ça, évidemment, c'était au cœur du projet, euh, et leur personnalisation visait, entre autres, à engager et à soutenir l'intérêt des étudiants 
tout au long de la session pour la personne à, auprès de qui ils allaient intervenir. Euh, on a choisi volontairement, comme vous pouvez le voir, des personnages assez typés, euh, mais suffisamment réalistes là, pour que les étudiants puissent s'y reconnaître quand même comme une vraie intervention. Tout ça, ça s'est fait en euh, deux phases. Euh, la première que vous voyez en haut, c'était vraiment travailler avec... Euh, notre, te notre technicienne en art graphique qui a fait des dessins d'émotions pour chacun des personnages qu'on a collé euh, à la bulle de texte de l'avatar. Donc, il y avait une, une émotion statique finalement par bulle de texte. Et dans une deuxième phase, on est allé en partenariat avec euh, le bac en sciences de l'animation euh, à l'Université Laval et les étudiants du cours Studio 1 nous ont fait des animations, des émotions des avatars en 3D. Donc là, ça nous a permis d'avoir une série d'extraits euh, vidéo courts de 2-3 secondes qu'on pouvait mettre ensemble pour finalement refléter davantage les émotions vécues par l'avatar euh, au cours de la rencontre avec l'intervenant. Donc ça, ça a été vraiment une, une étape importante du développement. Euh, il y a d'autres éléments qui ont structuré notre réflexion tout au long et qui nous ont amenés à faire des choix. Euh, la première, le premier de ces, ces éléments-là, euh, c'est en fait la volonté de créer un contexte d'apprentissage le plus près possible d'une intervention réelle, mais aussi, euh, comme Julie Le Sart l'a mentionné plus tôt, euh, une intervention sécuritaire pour les personnes apprenantes et les usagers. Euh, donc, on a commencé d'abord par penser à nos avatars quand même à, à engager les étudiants. Donc, il y a un affichage dynamique de euh, la discussion au clic. Euh, la scénarisation de l'intervention sert en fait de modelage aux étudiants vers une, ce que c'est que, que par une bonne intervention. Donc, il n'y a pas de choix, là, il n'y a pas de, de, de branching en bon français. Euh, L'étudiant, il prend connaissance de la discussion puis en même temps, il recueille toute l'information qui est nécessaire pour prendre une décision concernant la suite de l'intervention. Donc, le premier moment d'analyse et de préparation du cas se déroule à l'extérieur de la classe. L'étudiant prend euh, contact avec l'avatar et puis se documente pour justifier sa réponse à une question qui est posée euh, pour chacune des rencontres. À chaque fois, il y a trois choix de réponses qui lui sont proposés. Ce sont toutes des réponses acceptables, mais en fait, il y en a une qui est meilleure que les autres et les deux autres euh, présentent plus ou moins des lacunes plus ou moins importantes. Cette préparation-là, elle est nécessaire et la justification est nécessaire car ça prépare l'étudiant à une discussion clinique qui aura lieu par la suite en classe. Donc, les étudiants, à la fin du cours, se réunissent en équipe une vingtaine de minutes et ils doivent discuter ensemble pour sélectionner une réponse consensuelle à la même question qui leur a été posée. La visée de cet article là entre le travail individuel et le travail en équipe, c'était vraiment d'aller chercher un contexte réel d'intervention où la plupart des décisions vont se prendre en équipe multidisciplinaire. Donc, chaque étudiant doit apprendre à communiquer et à faire valoir son point de vue tout en écoutant celui des autres. Puis, en même temps, ils doivent accepter que le consensus n'est pas toujours du coup, dans la direction qu'ils auraient souhaité au départ. Isabelle elle a souvent remarqué que plus la session avance, finalement, plus les étudiants accordaient d'importance à, à la préparation individuelle pour arriver avec un argumentaire fort au moment de la discussion clinique. Il faut aussi mentionner que l'outil n'est pas autoportant en soi, c'est-à-dire qu'Isabelle a un rôle super important à jouer durant euh, la discussion clinique. Elle va vraiment accompagner les étudiants à faire le tour des équipes, euh, réorienter euh, la discussion au besoin, euh, essayer d'éliminer un peu les obstacles. Donc, elle a vraiment un rôle important à jouer. Le deuxième élément qui nous a vraiment beaucoup préoccupé, c'est l'articulation de l'évaluation et de l'activité tout au long de la session. Euh, donc, euh, l'activité euh, visait évidemment à évaluer euh, l'application la, la, de la théorie à la pratique et elle vise également à s'assurer que les étudiants s'investissent dans l'activité tout au long de la session. Donc, il y a des points qui étaient accordés à la préparation individuelle euh, en termes de faits non faits pour s'assurer que les étudiants aient un argumentaire et puissent participer activement à la discussion clinique. Et il y avait aussi eu des points accordés euh, à euh, la discussion en équipe, donc à la réponse qu'ils allaient choisir de donner. Euh, L'autre élément qui est super intéressant, c'est que suite à la soumission de la réponse d'équipe au terme du cours, l'enseignant débloquait une rétroaction expli qui explicitait aux étudiants quels éléments étaient à considérer pour avoir fait le meilleur choix et pourquoi les autres choix n'étaient pas aussi intéressants ou appropriés que, que le premier. Fait qu Encore une fois, on venait modeler aux étudiants quoi regarder euh, en termes d'intervention. 
Alors, on va vous présenter maintenant les effets déclarés par les étudiants. Euh, ces effets-là ont été recueillis par le système d'évaluation euh, de l'enseignement, qui est un outil qui est pan campus et sur lequel les étudiants peuvent se prononcer en général sur ce qu'ils ont aimé, moins aimé, euh, détesté. En fait, ils ont le droit de mettre ce qu'ils veulent et c'est formidable parce que ça nous sert vraiment d'outil pour ajuster nos évaluations, nos interventions par la suite. Alors, développer l'esprit critique en intervention, mais c'est vraiment ressorti beaucoup. Euh, les étudiants ont vraiment noté que ça les avait aidés à se questionner, à remettre en question leur façon de faire. Mais beaucoup d'étudiants disent que euh, ça ne s'est pas fait seul. Donc, ça prend un accompagnement aussi de la part de la professeure. Ça prend dans le, dans le cadre du cours aussi une préparation à cet, cet esprit critique, mais les avatars permettent de faire le pont et de faire descendre. Euh, faciliter l'identité professionnelle, c'est revenu euh, maintes et maintes et maintes fois. Les gens ont développé beaucoup plus de confiance par rapport à leurs capacités. Ils ont vu aussi toutes les possibilités qui s'offrent aux psychoéducateurs. Euh, certains se sont, se sont sentis rassurés aussi par l'approche euh, des stages. Donc, vraiment, les gens ont eu un aperçu de ce que serait leur vie professionnelle et cela les a confrontés, euh, certains, ou les ont confrontés confortés dans leur choix euh, d'être des psychoéducateurs. Apprendre de ses erreurs. Bon, mais on ne peut pas dire qu'en psychoéducateur, euh, en psychoéducation, on a des étudiants qui aiment beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup apprendre de leurs erreurs. On ne peut pas dire que c'est vraiment une de leurs plus grandes qualités, mais quand même, on a senti que certains ont dit, ben, quand même, euh, ça a été difficile, c'est un cours difficile, mais c'est correct, c'est réaliste, j'ai été capable de passer à travers. Appréhender la complexité des cas et développer un raisonnement cli clinique sophistiqué, ça c'est vraiment ressorti. Euh, je trouve ça très intéressant. Les étudiants voient vraiment le lien entre ça et la réalité. Hein. Quelqu'un nous dit « trois choix proposés sont tous bons » est aussi un aspect pertinent puisque cela représente la réalité où nous avons plusieurs options, mais nous devons déterminer la meilleure selon les besoins du client. Alors pour moi, cette phrase-là résume bien ce qu'on cherchait à faire et ça a été atteint par le biais euh, des avatars. Réduire l'écart entre la théorie et la pratique, c'est sûr que beaucoup d'étudiants disent « c'est le fun, on a l'opportunité de, de mettre nos, nos apprentissages » En réalité, quelqu'un nous dit que c'est un bijou en termes d'apprentissage. Euh, c'est vraiment intéressant. Mais ce que j'aime le plus, euh, c'est vraiment la citation suivante de l'étudiant qui dit euh, « ça m'a permis hein, de comprendre les différentes approches théoriques parce que j'ai pu les mettre en application, j'ai pu les voir ». Donc, c'est devenu concrète pour elle. Elle les connaissait déjà, mais elle n'avait jamais eu l'occasion de les faire descendre. Et là, elle était capable de euh, s'en souvenir. Faciliter la rétention des connaissances, c'est sûr, c'est quelque chose, c'est le fun, ça permet d'assimiler la matière. On a des gens qui nous disent textuellement ça, mais j'aime encore mieux la prochaine citation où les gens disent « ça m'a amené à avoir des discussions avec mon équipe, mais aussi avec d'autres personnes à l'extérieur de la classe. » C'est Les avatars m'ont questionné et le fait d'avoir discuté ces choses-là, ça m'a permis d'aller plus loin dans mes apprentissages, donc ça, ça ne s'arrête pas à l'activité euh, pédagogique en tant que telle. Une autre citation, 20 fois sur le métier, remettez votre ouvrage, polissez le sans cesse et repolissez, ajoutez quelques fois et souvent effacez. Bon, ben écoutez, on n'a pas eu juste des bons coups. Euh, les étudiants, euh, surtout nos étudiants qui sont très, très, très performants, trouvent ça très, très difficile qu'on euh, ne valorise pas le processus de la discussion clinique. Parce que là, l'équipe est évaluée uniquement sur la décision. Puis ils disent, mais c'est pas juste parce que j'avais la bonne réponse. Puis ils trouvent que c'est difficile aussi d'être évalué avec un point, trois points, cinq points selon la qualité de la réponse. Mais on aime vraiment beaucoup la citation de l'étudiante qui dit, je me questionne encore un peu sur l'évaluation de l'équipe, mais j'ai pas trouvé de modèle qui me ressemblerait plus adéquat tout en percevant les visées de la présente formule. Ben nous non plus. Alors, si dans la période de questions, vous avez des suggestions, on va être extrêmement extrêmement ouverte à les entendre. Euh, en terminant, euh, si mon vidéo fonctionne, vous allez voir bouger Maxime. Euh, je veux juste ajouter que dans notre expérience, les avatars ont vraiment permis d'atteindre toutes les cibles qui avaient été identifiées par la littérature, mais c'est aussi un outil ludique. Les étudiantes adorent faire ça, les étudiants aussi, ils nous en parlent beaucoup. Ça m'a dégagé d'un nombre incalculable de corrections, mais attention, m'en a ajouté des tonnes aussi en conception, réflexion, polissage, ajout, retrait. C'est vraiment un outil extraordinaire, surtout si on y croit, qu'on a des objectifs qui sont très clairs sur le plan de la pédagogie, des modalités d'évaluation, et là, ça devient un outil, à notre avis, qui est extrêmement pertinent pour la formation à l'intervention clinique. 
Voilà, et si je ne me trompe pas, on est 15 minutes 5 secondes. Voilà. Un grand merci Isabelle et Julie, Christine, c'est encore une fois comme c'est extraordinaire. Je vais passer rapidement pour s'assurer que je garde le temps de mon côté aussi à Marco. Donc Marco Luna, uh, he's a documentary filmmaker, part-time faculty and VR AR technologist from Concordia University, and he will be introducing different projects to discuss the creative processes and technical decisions made by production teams. So Marco, à toi. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Oh, well, um, are you hear, do you hear me well? Yes, it's working. Yes. Okay, so how are you doing, everyone? Uh, my name is Marco, Marco Luna, and um, I'm going to tell you, I, I'm a filmmaker, so I'm, I'm going to share, I'm going to share with you a uh, presentation, and we are going to start from here, let's say. There we go. So, um, Teaching and learning about immersive reality environments, collaboration, co-creation, and social engagement in VR creation at the Milieu Immersive Reality Lab. Um, so uh, what, what I wanted to tell you here, it's a story of how a lab was created, how a lab in VR creation was okay, created, and what do we learn in this process and how we were able to uh, share this to, to our students. Uh, so a little bit just about me, I'm a documentary filmmaker with post-production uh, film experience. So I've done many films uh, in the past and I have a social engaged background on making films. That's how uh, I started my, my career and also uh, working with uh, communities, uh, uh, communities at risk in Peru back, back in my country, but also here in Canada. Then I jumped into VR uh, development and interesting enough, I wanted to actually bring a, a narrative, uh, uh, a cinema narrative in interactive media, but also uh, taking into consideration ethics and representation. So um, you can think of me as a, a geek with a social conscience uh, when I started uh, this uh, journey. And um, so it all started six years ago. Uh, I was doing, I was participating in a film I call uh, I Am the Blues with Professor Daniel Cross of the a school of cinema at Concordia University. And of course, uh, when you do a film like this, you actually need uh, more funding. And uh, this is a film about uh, blues musicians in Mississippi. And uh, what happened was that at that time, I'm talking about uh, actually six years ago, uh, what happened is that uh, there was funds that were uh, available and one of the funds were telling us as, us as documentary filmmakers, you know, you can do a digital media component. So a digital media component was that, basically something on the web. And said, okay, perfect. Uh, we have no idea how to do it, but we're gonna grab the money anyway. So we went, we applied and we did this uh, little, we ran this little experiment with trying to translate the, the film into uh, a, a sort of a WebGL experience inside uh, inside uh, uh, running in a, in a web browser. The question here was that we were look, doing this linear storytelling, and uh, we were looking at a web uh, as a possibility space for uh, a keep. Um, advancing these stories, but also the fact that uh, this is a space where interactive elements, things that we didn't know as, as documentarians uh, now take place. So, um, so again, six years ago, we had a film, we had uh, a, a WebGL component and a headset that I just bought. And that's how we said, so, so we start to look at it, how do we, um, we have a video material with asset created for an interactive uh, experience and then a team of students that had no idea how to do a VR piece, what could go wrong? So that's what, I, what happened is that we created the researcher in interactive documentary filmmaking. And a, a, this researcher was mandated on looking at this. This is how VR was sold six years ago for us, for, for makers, for filmmakers. A, a world where you're gonna be immersed and you're gonna play and the story is gonna be with you and you're gonna be completely fully immersed and, and, and excited. But when, when, when artists jumped into uh, VR creation, the panorama looked more like this. 
we're like looking at the headset, we're looking at, and we're basically fighting with the medium and try to understand how we can start creating elements. So um, these are quotes that I got from a film festival back then that they were talking about VR creation and, and how you as an artist, as, as a filmmaker, you have to actually unlearn all your craft and suddenly just burn all your knowledge and reburn to this new genre because VR is whatever. So, so it was really, really um, a, the, the, the message was really strong that uh, whatever uh, our art was not uh, didn't fit in this in this environment. And we're like, okay, so we have to actually start taking a little bit advantage of this. We have to move forward. So what we did this uh, is um, we created this uh, the research in didactic documentary filmmaking, and we start asking us how documentary narratives are evolving in new technologies. Uh, we gather a multidisciplinary team of students, and we said, let's start doing short interactive documentary pieces. Okay. And because we have no idea how to do them, it's a process we call creation and teaching at the same time, basically learning by making. And I put in an emphasis on the learning because we had no idea. So we had to start from zero in terms of how to actually, how does the headset work and how do we start adding all these narratives inside. We gather this, our students, this is uh, the Rencontre Internacional de Documental de Montreal in 2016. Um, we um, gather a group of students coming from a film, journalism, a sculpture, uh, and a student from computational arts. And uh, they basically, we gathered the ones who were available at that moment and said, you don't want to do VR? And I said, okay. <laughs> so we gathered them and two days full workshop and trying to figure out how to make this uh, a project. And we kind of um, understood uh, the logic of just programming behind and how we can bring video, audio, and photo inside an immersive environment. Um, so that's how we started. We started just saying, okay, we need a multidisciplinary approach. We need different students with different superpowers. They're gonna come and they're gonna start adding uh, a, a mix of uh, their, their needs, their feelings, and, and what they can bring to the table. I know how to code, I know how to model, I know how to make a video, and everything become a, kind of a, a breeding ground. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about two projects quickly, and these two projects actually the, uh, created the, the basis of uh, the what happened later on on the creation of the lab itself. Um, so let's look at the uh, VR docs that we're making, the virtual reality documentaries. The first one was I am the Blues VR, of course, the one that we were supposed to do. We started doing this flow chart, trying to figure out how to uh, inject interactivity into our model. Of course, we are just filmmakers, so we have no idea how interactive works. So we start drawing these crazy lines saying if this, if, if if we see this, this happens. If we see this, this happens. If you touch this, this happens. But at the same time, this came on. We were thinking about we are be, uh, what we're doing in this process. Is, are we doing a translation? Are we looking at basically what we film, uh, the, the images of the film, and then we're basically modeling this for these images to fit another environment? So what kind of translation are we doing? Are we, uh, do we actually think that a, both mediums uh, fit together, or we have to find a, a, um, a way of just uh, a documentarians just embrace this space in a different way. And the problem was that at the same time, if you start turning around the character, you can see that we film flat characters because we film them in 2D. And that's kind of like, oh my God, okay, so we have this footage and it's all flat. So let's start working on this. Um, we started uh, this journey of character representation. Again, with students trying to figure out how to how are we gonna model this. So we went from different iterations, doing motion capture, trying to get the best approach. And then we got Bobby Rush. This is one of the main characters, Bobby Rush. And we got a, a, a version of him. But here's the problem. Uh, we are documentary filmmakers. We are really, uh, we're bound to ethics and ethics representation. And this is not Bobby Rush. Bobby Rush is the person who a lot of time to film him and created this, this a uh, trust environment with us. So his photographic image is uh, respected. And that wasn't the case because we went from different iterations. We actually did many things. We did a rig map, texture mapping. We really went crazy on how much we can push the technology uh, to use represent this character. 
but the ethical uh, issue was still in front of us. Character versus caricature. Bobby Rush is not Mario Bros. It's it's a human being that is on image. So we have to actually respect that. Um, and nothing that we're gonna do is gonna uh, compare to the uh, visual uh, the visual elements that he had. So anyway, so we keep building this project, and we kind of find a middle ground where how to represent characters uh, and photographic uh, uh, elements on this uh, on this journey. And that was one of the first uh, kind of uh, awakening element. The second one was doing Carlos and Alvin, another project where a, uh, one of our students decided to uh, put a 360 camera on the head of a blind person and said, I'm gonna, I wanna see how this person uh, navigates inside his own house. And uh, me as the user, we're gonna be able to see or, or feel how this blind person uh, perceive its world. So she started to do that. Uh, Andrea just put the camera on and you can see different perspectives and the shaky cam, shakiness because the person is walking. And, and that was uh, another, and again, an interesting exploration of 360 video. Okay, this is interesting, but ethics come back to always bite us. And the question here is, uh, being someone else, VR is an empty machine, who are you? to actually visually say that this is an actual representation of how the person feel or it. So we had to go back and said, okay, we have these issues in our head. Let's see what others are doing in, in, a, in the other, a, in an other a, a projects because the a interactive, the, the chair of interactive documentary filmmaking was also developing interactive uh, desktop and web uh, documentaries. So um, there was uh, one project developed uh, by another group that was called the Turkut Project, where we have all the, after when uh, the, the construction of the Turkut Highway was announced, uh, the community filmmakers went and started recording with the community and started working with the community toward the building of a documentary film that was never made. But we, then we have the footage and we created a desktop version of this, of this uh, 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 is, uh, telling the story of what happened. So community was important. The community needed to actually participate on the making. The same thing happened with another student of us uh, going uh, out and start recording her own a group, her own uh, environment and creating this project called Queer in the Night with um, a, all these a, a musicians try to actually represent themselves in a really male dominated environment. Uh, and for her, that was important also because it was, it was her who was doing this project and 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 uh, going back to our question in one where we're doing this a uh, uh, interactive project is that the, uh, the ethical representation also means diversity of makers. We need different people with different groups, multiple voices, and inclusion. So that was that that that, that was the leading element for the research uh, uh, creation. So we have all these students gravitating around the uh, researcher in interactive documentary filmmaking. And what happened was that when the research, uh, when this uh, researcher ended, Milieu took over and, and, and told us, you know what, let's continue this idea. Let's just keep going and let's open this cross cluster immersive reality. We're gonna try to replicate the same idea of just bringing students from different backgrounds, create community and just a, a push uh, the different voices and different groups. So um, one of the, so, so we started different things at, at the lab. We started multidisciplinary XR collaborations, students uh, creating a different a VR projects, uh, but the fact here is not necessarily the final, uh, the final uh, result. It's just the process on how you can have people coming from different areas and how can they start a dialogue in a creative process. Um, this is interesting because what happened was that we start bringing students from uh, computational art, from engineering to the School of Cinema to talk about storytelling because they went to the lab and, and suddenly the School of Cinema was opening the doors for this type of discussion just because of the excuse of a, of a weird lab that was doing this. So uh, the, the, the capacity of different dialogues between uh, students that in, in their normal uh, um, kind of a program will never have the chance to talk. We, we just created the excuse, the perfect excuse to do that. Then we start inviting artists uh, to talk about interactive narrative, uh, also what 
mean uh, artists from different fields, from film, from inter interactive uh, work, from also VR, and the. And, and this kept growing, workshops of VR creation, online workshops. Uh, so we were revisiting uh, workflows of uh, new workflows for new technologies to see how students can be engaged. And, and, and we kept doing that. So the, 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 the lab kept growing and growing. Uh, last year, we did a collaboration with Wapikoni and we worked with indigenous um, a, a, a creators because Again, representation of multiple voice, that's important. So we have to start pushing to include different new creators so that the technology should not be uh, uh, an element that actually blocks uh, the possibility of this participation. So, um, and then we started to expand and present on different film festivals. Um, but here's the thing, okay? So I, because I'm <laughs> running out of time right now. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you just my, my key notes and my, my key notes on, on, on what happened after all these five years of working in the, in, on the lab, okay? First of all, what is a lab? What is our lab? Our lab is not a production house. And that's important to say, we are not there to actually produce great feature film or projects or VR projects. We're there to experiment and to just play with the medium and figure out what we can do. Why? Because we embrace error, mistakes and incomplete projects. That's the nature of a lab. We are not a production house with a lab. So in the lab, we are bound to error and the errors are part of this discovery and this, learn, this, uh, this uh, process of learning. Uh, and on the space, we have to be able to share knowledge. It's not a space where you go and you just are involved in your own uh, personal project. You have to be able to share it to others. So we have to create those space. Don't be afraid to learn coding. That's important. So that's everyone has to, if you want to go into VR world, somehow you have to go through it. Um, and for just, just at last, um, as a last idea, if you want to start your own VR lab, okay? So if you, um, I've, I've talked to other uh, universities or groups that want to start their own VR projects, uh, spaces. So first of all, invest in people, don't invest in machines, okay? So training, and it's important that people learn the back of the, the back end. I'm a filmmaker and I learn how to do this. Other people from other spaces are learning from other specialities just by learning three lines of code and the right software and they can do their own project. Why? Because the creation process might be more important than the final result. And this is important for a, 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 to creating a learning, a, le learning a environment. It's just to see how much a, you can do not only with the final product, but also with creation process. And again, diversity of voices, uh, it make equals diversity of makers. And that's the aim of the uh, cross cluster immersive reality lab at Concordia University. Sorry, I was Thank running. You, I, I <laughs> so we still had a lot to learn. Yeah, but we need to move to our next presenter. So thank you so much, Marco. Uh, Yuji. So Yu Jian is a communication PhD student at Stanford University's Virtual Human Interaction Lab. And she's also the teaching assistant for virtual people, one of the first courses that were set entirely in VR. So Yu Ji, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marco. Awesome, all right, I'm gonna share my screen and all right. So yeah, hi, um, as Nadia introduced, my name is Uki and I am a Second year, okay, there you go. I am a second year PhD student at the Virtual Human Interaction Lab at Stanford. And I'm gonna briefly talk about one of the courses that we offered in the summer and the fall called Virtual People. And I'm gonna share some of the lessons that we learned, what the course structure was like, and some recommendations that we have for people who kind of want to maybe adopt a course that's very similar to um, the course that we adopted. So as, um, as recently as many of you guys may have known, the metaverse is gaining a lot of interest and traction. And the metaverse is essentially, although there are many different conceptualizations of it, one potential um, definition of it is social VR, which are basically collaborative virtual environments in which people can interact with one another in 3D space in real time. And some of the more famous examples of social VR worlds include Facebook Horizon, VR Chat, Rec Room, and engage. And yeah, these are essentially rooms where people can meet and interact with as avatars in real time. 
And these are often really attractive to a lot of instructors and researchers alike because they VR and social VR provides a lot of affordances that are pretty unique and you can't find them in other mediums. So for example, you can sort of encourage and promote creativity by having students use the spatial components of social VR. So they can draw in 3D space, they can put models um, and bring in different objects and kind of like spin them around, scale them in size, walk through them. And there are also a lot of unique nonverbal cues that we can't really get through Zoom. Um, so for example, if someone is standing really close to me, I can feel their presence and I feel as though someone is next to me and I can see where they're looking at. So those give off cues that I can't really tell from a 2D screen. And there's also obviously the Im immersion or presence aspect of it. So if you want to take your students to places that you can't really um, afford to, or you, it's really impossible to bring students to different places. So for example, if you wanna take students to the moon or underwater, that may be possible maybe in a few years um, or a few hundred years, but for now it's really expensive and impossible. So VR could provide um, a solution for that. So there are many reasons why social VR or VR in particular, um, is exciting for a lot of instructors in it. I, and I think this is one of the reasons um, why we wanted to kind of toy around with the idea of potentially moving virtual people into virtual reality. So as a roadmap today, I'm gonna to talk about some of the factors that we considered before running the class. And then I'm gonna talk about the class itself. And as a full, discla full disclaimer, um, because our, the nature of our lab is a research lab, we did conduct some studies while also running the course. Um, so I'm gonna kind of talk about the questions that we asked and they might be interesting because they have to, they relate a lot to avatars and the types of environments that we um, thought or we had questions about. Um, and then we, I'm, I'm gonna also briefly talk about some of the questions that I believe should be considered given the qualitative um, findings that I observed as a TA. And then I'll talk about the future directions and recommendations and how we can work as instructors and also collaborate with one another and potentially developers and um, industries to make sure that this using VR in classrooms or bringing students into VR for classrooms doesn't fall into this dangerous rabbit hole of um, people hating it, everyone hating it, and yeah. So yeah, I'll first start with talking about some of the factors that we considered before the class. Um, so one thing that is often limiting in a lot of VR studies is that it's really hard to bring people into a lab and or it's really hard to bring multiple people into the lab and study how they interact um, in real time in VR. So oftentimes a lot of research studies are limited to diets and triads. So diets are basically two people interacting and triads are three people interacting. And, um, but the thing is the moment that there are multiple people in, in, a, in an interaction, group dynamics change a lot and there are a new there are a new set of nonverbal behaviors and cues that come off and it's hard to really draw conclusions about social VR and how people interact within them based on studies that are solely based on diets and triads so one thing that we wanted to do was um, kind of manipulate and look at the group size of um, the class of the class discussions that we had and another thing that we really wanted to consider was this dimension of time. Um, so oftentimes a lot of VR studies and a lot of courses are sort of one-off sessions. It's that, that experience inside VR is sort of the field trip of its own. Um, so you bring in students to VR once and then you're done, you collect data on that, um, and then you draw conclusions based on that. But we believe that, or we hypothesize that that's not really an accurate description of, or depiction of how people use VR for classrooms. Um, so for example, think about when you first bought your phone and you had to set it up and you had to kind of download applications and you learned how to make shortcuts. And if someone were studying that brief period in, of time in which you were trying to get accustomed to using your phone, that wouldn't really be an accurate description or an accurate depiction of how you actually use it. So we wanted to see, okay, what happens if over time, if the novelty sort of wears off, how do people interact within these social virtual environments? And then another thing that we looked at were avatars and environments. So we had two studies, um, one done in the summer class and then one done in the fall. 
And in the summer class, we focused on avatars. And then in the fall study, we looked at environments. And I'll kind of elaborate on that a little bit later. Um, so virtual people um, is a huge class. So uh, around 100 students attended or enrolled in the summer class, and then around 200 enrolled in the fall class. So what we did was we sent Oculus Quest 2 headsets to all the students. So they came to our lab to pick up the headsets, or we sent them out. And so each student had their own headset that they used in their own respective rooms, their dorm rooms, their houses. And then every week um, for around 30 minutes in groups of nine to 14 ish people, they would meet inside a social VR platform and we would engage in different activities. Um, and so the study portion of that sort of looks at the nonverbal behavior. So we looked at tracking data and we also collected survey data on how people's attitudes changed. So we looked at like realism, presence and different things like that. Um, and if you're interested in reading more about the research behind it, there is a preprint of the paper and I, I put the title here. Um, it's available on SSRN, but I'll be focusing more on sort of the qualitative aspect of it um, and sort of what I observed as a teaching assistant in helping implement the course. Um, so in, as I mentioned earlier, in the summer course, we sort of focused on avatars. So we had students in, in, in each different session, um, students would either embody a, a self avatar or a uniform avatar. So our question was mainly, what would happen if people all looked the same versus if they looked like themselves? And we had some theories about sort of, oh, if a lot of the visual cues are reduced, maybe they will feel the stronger sense of groupiness because there is no factors that sort of distinguish you versus me. Um, so would students sort of feel like, oh, we're a collective whole versus, oh, would they be sort of weirded out? Would they feel uncomfortable? So that was one thing that we looked at in the summer study. And then in the fall, we looked at the environment. So we were interested in how um, nature could provide, given that nature often provides a very restorative effect. We kind of wanted to see if that translate, translates into VR in this context. We also looked at constrained environments versus larger environments where we where you could see a large amount of space. Um, so yeah, those were sort of the two things that we studied in those um, two courses. So the platform we decided to use was one that's called Engage. So Engage is really great in that it allows you to draw in 3D space. So you see um, on the far right, you see people using a 3D pen. You see people form groups and talk. And they could also bring up a whiteboard and put sticky notes on them. And you could also bring in a model and sort of spin it around, scale it, and then see, show people basically what's inside your mind. And so this course ran for around, or at least the VR portion of it ran for around eight weeks. So they, the students um, spent time inside VR for 30 minutes for around eight weeks. So we had a training session um, at the very beginning. We had two training sessions for the summer and then one for the fall. Um, and we noticed that one or two is usually enough, but usually um, there should be an ample amount of training. And we made sure that students didn't feel overwhelmed and they weren't completely lost by the first time they came into VR. So we sort of packed these training sessions with a lot of activities. Um, and we made sure that students failed. We made sure that students asked a lot of questions. We repeated a lot of information. They all interacted with one another. So it was basically like 50 people in one virtual environment. And they were all just bringing things and getting kicked out. And it was just really messy, but it was perfect because by the time they went to their first session, everyone sort of, or not everyone, but most people were sort of really comfortable with the virtual environment already. So some things that I think are really important in um, considering, some questions that I think are important in considering are, what should be inside VR? So I think a lot of instructors are really ambitious and um, in that we want to, you know, because VR is so cool, we want to make sure that students really appreciate it. But sometimes we might get lost in that sort of idea of 
or, or, or visions that we may have. So we implement everything inside VR. And some of that may not be the best if it is inside VR. And a lot of more, a lot more interactions are actually really valuable um, outside of VR. So really knowing and understanding what, um, and that's this, my second question, what your desired learning outcomes of the class are. So if you want more experiential learning, if you want more factual learning, if you want students to be creative, depending on what type of outcome you want for your um, students, it's really important to know what should be inside VR, also given that there is this physical time limit. And I, and I know some other um, professors here mentioned that there is simulator sickness. So using that 30 minutes really wisely is really important. And also the second thing that we considered was um, how much support, technical support can we provide to the students? So one thing we did was we kept a Zoom session open at all times when all the sessions were going on. Um, and we had a TA sort of being there and helping any students just because if students get lost or kick, kicked out of VR, it's really daunting for them. Um, and we noticed that in a lot of the open-ended responses that we collected. So we, want to, we wanted to make sure that students didn't feel as though they were sort of isolated and didn't have any support and help in that idea, in that um, sense. And another thing that I think a lot of um, instructors might be wondering about is what is out there? There's so much VR content and I'm looking for X, Y, Z, but it's really hard for me to find something somewhere. And I have this headset versus this headset and each headset and the companies that they belong in sort of operate in different ways. So the stores that they offer and the apps that they offer might be slightly different. So it might be a little bit daunting um, to kind of navigate what's out there. So one um, question that I uh, wanted to what that, that I think is really important in considering is really evaluating what type of content's out there and talking to other instructors and professors um, who run research studies and seeing what they use and what might be compatible for your specific um, course. And another thing is what will the VR setup look like in a classroom? So we were really fortunate enough to send headsets to all our students, but we also realize that that is a huge privilege and not every instructor, not every institution is going to have that opportunity. Um, but the thing is, there are several solutions to that. One is potentially being um, having, having sort of a library system where we have a set amount of your headsets and then having students um, use them in a checkout borrowing type of system. Um, another thing is kind of understanding how many or how many VR sets are absolutely necessary for me to achieve my desired goals. So there are a few things that I guess I think we can work together um, as instructors to sort of evaluate what are our limitations and what our resources are and sort of considering these um, questions. And yeah, and I think I briefly mentioned this um, kind of planning for the 25 to 30 minutes of time that people have before they start feeling really sick. Um, is really important, but also planning for what will happen outside of it, because a lot of the valuable interactions do come from just simply seeing someone physically and saying like, hey, how was your weekend? Like, how's your day going? And those might not be interactions that necessarily play out in VR, just simply because of the affordances that come with it. And similar to how we have our mics muted right now, um, in VR, there are some other affordances that kind of inhibit some of these really valuable interactions that happen only in the physical world from happening. And I'm running out of time, but one thing that I did want to uh, also talk about was sort of the future direction of how we can work not only with other instructors, but also with developers, with creatives, um, with people from industry, and also with other students to see how we can make sure that VR is used in the best way possible without it becoming sort of this, this failed technology that people think is really uncool and really horrible. And they're like, oh, I hate it. This is absolutely the worst thing I've ever tried. Um, so yeah, um, and I'm gonna just skip over this. And I wanted to quickly thank my collaborators. And if you're interested in learning more about the study and also the course, feel free to contact me. I'll leave this briefly up here. But yeah, thank you so much. 
Thank you, Nadia. Thank you to all presenters. This was quite uh, the trip around the VR world uh, from the clinical studies to uh, making VR through uh, studying VR. And one of the things that we, we don't have much time, so I'll just make a quick commentary and I'll ask you a question. But one of the things that I noticed is that there is really a difference between um, learning, uh, learning uh, about VR, learning from VR, learning with VR and learning through VR. There are some clear distinctions here that I think need to be made, and, and we probably don't have time to unpack what that conversation means, but maybe if I could hear you rapidly, uh, each team of presenters, in terms of what you could have done differently if you had to restart this project or if you had to restart your practice. So in français, qu'est-ce que vous auriez fait différemment si, uh, maintenant que vous avez appris, you now that you have the benefit of hindsight, uh, if you had to restart this project? So open the floor to anybody. Okay, um, so one thing that I was struggling with was um, because this was both a research study and we were really interested in sort of finding things that would be informative for people in a few years. Um, one thing that I did struggle with was sort of balancing both teaching and also being a researcher. Um, but in the summer, I'm teaching a different course that's kind of similar in that it's a long-term course and we are trying to also encourage people to go inside VR. And I think a lot of the, what, what I would do differently is instead of having these sort of repetitive um, each week being going inside the same virtual world, which was engaged um, and had doing sort of similar activities. One thing I would do is have students sort of go out into different social VR worlds and sort of create their own definition of what learning and what the metaverse is. So what that, that, that's, I think, one thing I would do differently, sort of learning how to balance um, both studying VR and how learning happens in VR and also allowing students to sort of explore that on their own and learn on their own. Thank you. Anybody else? I, I'll jump in. Uh, I think uh, from the perspective of, of, of the lab and the process that we follow, uh, one of the elements that uh, came up late, and I will, and, and I, I think in the retrospective, maybe it should have been one of the key elements that actually working with communities from the beginning is actually is that uh, we had the machine, we had the, the, cre the, the creation process. Uh, it was more geared to specific students with the specific needs and, and faculty. And I think that we forgot that uh, if we could actually start uh, bringing other groups and create collective uh, co-creation processes, uh, that may, might have fueled the lab uh, differently. Um, this is just happening recently now. And because of, the, of COVID, uh, we got all got, uh, stopped by but I think that, that that's a, a case, just uh, making sure that everyone can participate on the creation also, not only on the doing process. Thank you, Marco. Is there anybody else who would like to interject? Um, yes, that was a question that we had at the end of our presentation, like, what would we do differently? And our answer to that would have been, um, to engage in that kind of project with a total different uh, orientation, um, going through the project as an exploratory project instead of uh, trying to reach a very clear goal right from the beginning. And that would make a very big difference um, for many, many reasons, but for the pressure that that was put on the project and the pressure that we would feel to get to that point, because going through a VR project was really exploratory. So that would be a main difference. And the other thing is that we would um, go for something way smaller and maybe not oriented on interactions between people because um, having a scripted scenario, making people interact, make choices, made the project very, very uh, huge. So we would go with something more observing in uh, the apartment, uh, making tiny choices, but make it really small at first and then make the project grow bigger as we uh, gain in experience so that goes uh, is very coherent with uh, what Mar marco was saying like learning going through the process mm -hmm. 
Julie, did you want to say something? Uh, no, I think Mo said it all. I agree with this totally. Yes. Okay. Isabelle, on your end, anything to add? No, no, on est parfait. No, mais <laughs> notre objectif était tellement clair. Tu sais, pour nous, c'est relativement simple. Puis on était comme assez chanceux que les, les étudiants réagissent rapidement, positivement. Puis tout ce qu'on fait après, c'est s'éroder, augmenter le nombre de cas. Et, fait pour nous, c'est juste un projet qui est en évolution, mais on n'a pas eu de problème vraiment majeur là, dans la mise en œuvre de notre projet. Que... Ouais. C'est super. Euh, mais il y a certainement plusieurs euh, facteurs pédagogiques euh, qu'on pourrait discuter. Euh, peut-être Il ne reste peut-être pas assez de temps pour en discuter, mais toute la question de qu'est-ce qu'on enseigne, jusqu'à quel point est-ce que les étudiants sentent que ce n'est pas vraiment réel, puis la valeur ajoutée de transporter ces informations-là ou ces contenus-là dans un environnement virtuel. Et puis ensuite, l'autre question, c'est à savoir, est-ce qu'on y va simplement avec des, des, des avatars? Est-ce qu'on vraiment prend tout le temps qu'il faut pour développer des environnements virtuels dans le métaverse? Euh, ou est-ce que tout simplement, on se replie un peu sur notre réflexion, puis on, on y voit avec des, des branching scenarios, avec euh, storyline? Parce que finalement, là, on a l'impression parfois qu'il y a des grosses expériences de VR qui pourraient être très, très bien dans Articulate ou dans Storyline, et puis qui prendraient beaucoup moins de ressources. Alors, il y a toute une réflexion pédagogique à faire là-dessus, euh, mais euh, évidemment, votre... Euh, votre rapport aujourd'hui a été super. Moi, j'ai été impressionnée de vos résultats, de vos réflexions. Very uh, insightful conversations, delectable conversations around VR, I must admit. And uh, it was wonderful to, uh, to see all your work. Uh, Nadia, do you have a, a, work, a word for the end? Or uh, Just to, uh, invite uh, everybody? <laughs> yeah, huge thank you for, for the presentation, for, for accepting the invitation to, to come and share uh, the amazing work that you're doing. It was really very impressive. I knew it was it, it, will, it would be a, an amazing symposium, and, and you made it really very successful. So thank you so much. We didn't have time to, to open the floor for more uh, questions, but I think that already you gave a lot of things uh, for our audience to think about and really reflect when they want to uh, to to um, s'aventurer uh, in such um, an experience and uh, aventure so thank you so much and uh, everyone have a great afternoon thank you thank you Nadia. thank you panelists wonderful one hour together <laughs> <laughs>